I'll say a few words about, about Scott, our guest speaker. I've had the pleasure of meeting him now a couple of times, which is just great, over at Regis. Um, and if you haven't been there, you must. So talk to them about going to see this wonderful new concept. Scott grew up in the Chicago area in Mount Prospect and earned a BA from Indiana University. After living in Florida for a few years working for Walt Disney, he moved back to Chicago to work in technology and sales. We did find out that we had acting in common, which is great, great fun. For many years, Scott worked in the PC and software industry before getting into real estate with the headquarters and ultimately Regis, or with HQ and ultimately Regis, where he, had been, he has been for the last nine years. Presently, Scott is the market director for the Chicago area, where Regis has 33 locations, employs 125 people, and supports over 5,000 unique businesses every day. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Scott Nellis. I'm not sure I really need to use that, but I will, um, just because it's going to be easier. And I uh, fully intend that this is going to go viral when it's done, so I'm going to stay at the podium just so that we can get the Lake Forest Lake Bluff uh, logo on there so that all of you can take advantage of that. So um, I woke up this morning thinking of something strange. I was actually thinking of the apocalypse. And uh, I know that sounds a little weird, but you know, December 21st is coming up. And you know that according to the Mayan calendar, it's all supposed to end on December 21st, 2012. Today is 10, 10, 12. And I was thinking, you know, it's less than a month away from the election, and this is really a unique time with this particular election because regardless of the candidate that you support, if the opponent wins, the apocalypse is surely going to happen. <laughs> and uh, in addition to that, there was ice on my windshield, and it's only October 10th. So I thought it was appropriate to start this off with the apocalypse. Um, what we're going to talk about, and uh, it, hopefully it'll be a little interactive, I, I definitely want to learn more about uh, any experiences that you have with you know, the changing of the workplace today, but that's really what, um, what we're seeing a lot of in Regis. And for those of you who don't know Regis or what we are, we, we are the world's largest provider of flexible office space. And this is uh, professionally staffed, fully furnished, essentially ready to go office space and we are a global organization we have over 1200 locations throughout the world and uh, here in Chicago we have over 750,000 square feet and uh, and it's a it's a fairly sizable business and a pretty big reach with the number of different companies that uh, that do business with us on a daily basis using us for office services but what we'll talk about is we'll talk about the changes that are taking place in the workplace today and kind of go back in time a little bit and, and look back over the changes of the last 40 years and, and essentially what's happened um, differently in the marketplace today and how uh, the workplace has changed. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with lifestyle. A lot of it has to do with technology changes. And we'll discuss some of those things and reminisce about it and laugh and have fun poking fun at, uh, at the past. But we'll also talk about then what's driving the change today because there are many different factors uh, and uh, I, I think environmental factors as well as economic factors that are driving businesses decisions today that are changing how people are actually working and how people think of the office and how people use the office. And then we're going to talk about what we're doing as Regis is one of the largest providers of office space in the world. We're one of the largest leaseholders in the world. What are we doing to help drive that or react to that? So, Kind of getting into it a little bit, let's uh, kind of back up a little bit to the 70s. And uh, I, I did grow up in the 70s and 80s, so these are all things that I'm very familiar with. But uh, it was a very different time. And, you know, of course, we had things like, uh, you know, the disco era and things that, and eight tracks and things that we'd probably like to forget about. But uh, the way people worked was very different than the way that it is today. So back in the 70s, you had like the executive, you had the start of the executive suite. You had uh, you know, a big corner office, you had somebody that had a big desk, and you had a lot of files. And in order to get work done, you uh, also had a secretary. And that secretary would answer the phone for you, take messages for you, take dictation, do things like that. And uh, you also had, uh, you know, I think, very um, rigid hours to the day. You had nine to five hours. You, know, you, you got up, you went to work. Work was at the office. And when you went to work, you went to the office. And uh, it was very much tied to the people that helped support you within that office and the work that you were doing. Of course, telephone was uh, obviously a pretty big use of communication skills, but that was by and large the, the largest communication that people had, along with face-to-face -face meetings, driving to meet uh, appointments, and you know some things are going to be universal throughout 
um, you know, that, uh, that face-to-face is one thing that uh, I, I think businesses are still struggling with today that we'll get to a little bit later on with all this advent of uh, additional communication. But I was talking with Maria a little bit earlier, and uh, you know, when, when I grew up, I remember we, we went to one grocery store. We went to the Jewel. And uh, you know, every uh, Friday night, uh, one of the things I'd do is I'd go to the bank with my dad. And my dad would get cash out for the week, and that's pretty much you know, how you did everything, right? So there's one bank, one grocery store. And you know, fast forward to today, I have to go to like four or five different places to get the things I need just to save a dollar on uh, you know, paper towels. You, know, you go to Target, you go to Walmart, you go to Costco for this or that, you go to the Jewel, and then you go to um, Trader Joe's or maybe even go to Whole Foods, you know, all to get a better deal or to get something that's organic and supposedly healthier for you. So it's a lot more complex than where we were back in the 70s. You know, and when you look at some of the technology that we had, we had mainframe computers and you had terminals that people could work on. And that was really, you know, kind of the height of the mainframe, um, you know, way of, uh, of collecting data. And, uh, you know, back to the TV 8-tracks, you had LPs, you had tapes starting to come on. It was very different. You know, and I, I remember even then getting into the 80s, we all drove around in station wagons, right? That's what I drove in high school. My parents were determined that uh, um, I was... Uh, not going to be cool, and they made sure that I wasn't going to be cool by making me drive a station wagon when I had the opportunity to drive. And they even put my name on the license plate, which wasn't very cool either, so everybody knew that it was me that was driving around in that station wagon with the fake wood paneling, too. It was really cool. Um, you know, in the 80s, we're still, I, I think we were at that place where work was still going to the office, and I think that we've been tethered to the office for quite some time. And in the 80s, it really wasn't any different. But people started to become more self-sufficient. Let's think about some of the advances that took place in the 80s. You had people, um, you know, the PC started to come up. You had Apple come out with the Apple II. You had uh, the personal computer, and you had IBM computers, and you had um, uh, car phones started to come into play. People carried around pagers with them. There was this need for people to be able to communicate outside of the four walls of the office. And this really was kind of the start of people being able to get away from the office. But still, people were tethered to the office because that's where work was done. That's where your work was. You couldn't take it with you unless you, you know, took huge amounts of files with you and you had a ton of stuff that you were going to um, you know, take around with you everywhere. And this was also when you know, we, had, uh, it, we move away from secretarial work and no longer calling people secretaries to calling them administrative assistants. And it was no longer somebody that was just simply answering the phone, doing everything for the executive. It was somebody that was actually much more self-sufficient as well. You know, you think about it with voicemail that started to uh, come online at that time. Uh, people no longer needed to have somebody answer the phone and take a message for them and deliver that to them via, um, you know, telex. Contracts no longer had to necessarily be typed up and, uh, and signed right there. You could fax them. And there were a lot of advances to technology that made it easier for people to be self-sufficient. Um, you know, and if we're looking at the, you know, the music industry as well, we go from LPs in the 80s to CDs at the end of the 80s. And you know, as we get into the 90s, I think this is where things really start to take off and really, things really start to escalate very quickly in terms of the technology. Everybody has, at the beginning of the 90s, everybody had a computer on their desk. Everybody had a tower underneath their desk, and by the end of the 90s, everybody had a computer at their house. And we started to see the uh, AOL started to, uh, uh, you know, really take off at this point, and everybody started to get dial-up access, you know, that sound that the modem made, and that's when U.S. Robotics was like one of the top companies in the world that doesn't even exist today. And so, you know, when we think that companies, just as a little side, we think that companies like Apple and Microsoft are always going to be around and they're the stalwarts. Think about those companies that were, you know, the, the darlings at that time, the U.S. robotics. They don't exist today. Things are changing so dramatically fast during this time. And at the end of the 90s, it's really when we had the tech boom. Everybody wanted to get into the Internet company. That was the new economy, right? The new economy where nobody actually had to make money. All you had to do was have a concept. And money was being thrown at you, and people were getting office space. And this is what was happening to our industry at this time. We had a ton of technology companies that come in, take a ton of space. Everybody wants to work in this new environment where we're going to put up ping pong tables, and we're going to put up uh, you know, all of these uh, pool tables. And you know, nobody really has to work because nobody really knows what the work is. But they still have to come to the office every single day. And so the office still is the place where everybody works. And why? Because everybody's tethered to the, um, um, to the power outlet. 
you know, really in many ways it's probably the battery that's changed the workplace more than anything else. Um, but um, as we start to get into the 2000s, this is when things really start to change. Because when you have the, um, you know, the tech bubble burst, so you have the tech bust at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the 2000s. Then you have events like 9-11 that take place. Then a little bit later, a few years after that, you find that Lehman Brothers goes under. What you find is that everybody was so interconnected to all of that. And one isolated event does not um, affect just one person. It actually affects everybody and everybody on a global scale. And that's really what's happening today is that the workplace is changing to the point where we really have a mobile workforce today. You know, so around the room, how many people have a smartphone? An iPhone or an Android phone? Exactly. And you check email on that? Yeah, and you, you probably have checked email while you're here, right? Just to, to touch base, to make sure you're not missing anything? I have. I just got like three emails while I've been sitting here. You know, and you, know, you, you have things in the 2000s like the, like the iPad. You know, I don't have to carry the paper around with me. I have a presentation right here that I can that I can work with. And you know, it's that this is really the first time in workplace history, if you will, um, that no, people are no longer tethered to the office. And that really is changing the way that businesses are looking at their real estate today and looking at their commercial real estate because the way that we work today is significantly different than the way that we worked even 10 years ago. You know, when I got into this industry, we still had probably five people employed at every business center. And I know that Maria can um, tell you stories that even five years before that, we had nine people at every business center. Today, at each one of our locations, we only have three people, two and a half to three people at every single center. And that's because everybody is so self-sufficient. And, you know, we were, Maria and I were talking about this earlier as well, how back in the 70s, when you had the executive in the office, it could have been a 200 square foot office which may or may not seem large to you, but it is when you only have one person in that office and it's a desk and uh, you know, the big executive with uh, maybe a, a, a little table in there and nice side chairs. And you know, now, nowadays when you have an executive that has a large office like that, it's probably because they want to put a treadmill in there or you know, be doing something uh, in addition to the work that they're actually doing. But what we're seeing for you know, migrating away from the cubicle farms um, Nobody ever really liked going into work in a cube every day. I mean, that's how you know, the Dilbert cartoon came around and some other you know, uh, various things of poking fun at the fact that we're a cubicle society and all you have is this little six by six space that you go into, but you get to decorate it however you want, as long as it's not offensive to anybody else, right? And you, know, you can't have personal phone calls in there and people are always talking like, uh, you know, trying to talk to their wife or their kids. And there are a million things that are happening at any given time. And so, um, that has actually changed now where people can work anywhere they want to. So I asked how many people have smartphones, how many people have actually worked in a Starbucks? Like you go into a, a, a Starbucks and you check your email in there, you have a cup of coffee, right? you read the paper, and if you go into a Starbucks today, they're completely filled. They're completely filled with people that are working. And you know, that is a productive way that people like to work. And the reason why people are doing that today is they want to work closer to home they want to work in an environment that's a lot more um, social, um, a little bit more friendly. But it, what businesses are struggling with the Starbucks model is it's expensive because you're paying $5 for a coffee every time you have it. And then you're also, I mean, Starbucks loves it because you're always going to be buying the pastries. You're going to be buying everything, you know, when you're in there. Nobody ever goes in there and just buys a tall cup of coffee and sits there for four hours. They're going to buy more stuff. So it's good for them, not necessarily productive for the average worker. And this is where I think that a lot of uh, businesses are actually struggling with that today, how to adapt to the mobile worker. Because let's face it, you all raised your hands that you have smartphones. You're working everywhere. And I think that the, the way that our society has changed and the lifestyles have changed, I, I have three kids. And my kids range in age from my, uh, a first grader um, all the way up to uh, my oldest son who's in eighth grade. And my daughter, by far, is the, uh, the most work out of all of them. But, uh, and she's in, she's in fourth grade. But the demands that we have as parents today, and especially as most people are dual income families, everybody's working today. You really don't have the one person working. And that means that we all share the duty of getting these kids from place to place. And let's face it, that hasn't really um, gotten any easier for anybody. 
I mean, I, I just, I was listing out some of the, th the activities that my wife and I have to get our kids to and from. So, you know, we have soccer practice, we have soccer games, we have uh, flag football, coaching flag football, we have Boy Scouts, we have Girl Scouts, we have Cub Scouts, we have all the campouts associated with that, we have travel football, we have violin lessons, we have private tutoring for math, we have, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And in the meantime, we still have to go to those five stores every weekend to get those particular things at the best possible price, right? So what's happening is, I think businesses are starting to realize, especially as we moved from the 90s into the 2000s. And you remember the 90s, the small office, home office. Anybody remember that, Soho? You know how that was like a really big trend, people working from their homes? Everybody works from their homes today. That's why nobody even calls it Soho anymore. It, it really is everybody. And that's because we have all these other demands that we have, and businesses, in order to keep the best people, are starting to adapt to the, the needs that people have to be able to maintain their lifestyles and be able to maintain some balance. So I think that what we're actually seeing is we're starting to see the emergence of really three factors that are driving the changes in the workplace today. And the first one is flexibility. And that kind of speaks to the, uh, 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 the needs that we have as individuals and as families and as we're trying to find balance in our lives. We need flexibility to work wherever, whenever, and however we want to work. I mean, nine to five is gone. If you're in a management position, that does not exist anymore. You know, how many people have, have exchanged emails at six o'clock in the morning or whenever it is that you get up? I mean, it's like the first thing I look at. I look at what emails I have and whether or not my boss sent something to me that I need to respond to immediately or ignore, pretend I didn't get it. But it's hard to pretend you don't get things anymore, right? You can't do, oh, I didn't get that message. Um, yeah, you did. Um, a little bit harder to get away with that kind of stuff. So you have to respond immediately to things. And um, that flexibility, I think, is really driven from what our needs are as individuals. But that flexibility also carries over into um, the other part of, uh, or the second major factor that I think is playing into this, into the changes, and that is mitigating risk. So even like the last 12 years, things have changed so much financially. Things have changed so much in terms of risk and aversion to risk. And I'm not just talking about you know, whether or not uh, you know, landlords want to take the risk on somebody that uh, whether or not they think has credit. I'm also talking about tenants that don't want risk either. And when you have those two things combined, when you have tenants that don't want to take on risk and you have landlords that don't want to take on risk, you get a lot of people that don't know what to do. Somebody has to absorb that. And you know the banks aren't absorbing that right now. and so. Where do they get the flexibility? Because flexibility, somebody has to pay for that flexibility. And that's why we're seeing, so I put an article on, uh, on every table there. It was just in the um, Chicago Tribune a couple days ago. And we didn't, um, this wasn't a, an article that was sanctioned by, uh, by Regis. We weren't interviewed for it. Uh, but Regis is mentioned in there, and that's not necessarily why I put it on your table. That's how I came across it. Um, but it actually talks to the, the mobile worker and it talks about the flexibility that's needed and how people can actually gain flexibility and be able to get office space where they need it, when they need it, in a productive professional environment without having to pay an arm and a leg for it. Because really, the third thing that's really driving the changes is that nobody wants to take on the capital expenditures that are required to really outfit offices today or you know, to invest in their business to the point where, let's face it, a lot of businesses out there don't know if they're going to be here in 90 days. Well, we all know the world is going to end within 90 days, and that brings up the apocalypse again. But aside from that, let's say that they are around 90 days from now. They don't know how healthy they're going to be in terms of their business. And so if your business, or conversely, maybe somebody expects a tremendous amount of growth. And, and this is the fourth thing that's happening is the globalization and the growth that's out there. So all these things are kind of interconnected. And they all are really changing the way that people are thinking about their commercial real estate. So let's say that you're a startup company and you and your partner are starting up this business and you have the ability to grow your business incredibly fast. Let's say it goes viral and everybody knows about it tomorrow morning, which is a possibility today. It wasn't a possibility back in the 70s. That's a real possibility today. And people are building their businesses to be able to support that. But let's say it doesn't happen. Well, let's say you think that it's going to happen and you're going to have to hire 100 people and you're going to have to go out there and get 25,000 square feet of office space to be able to support these people where we all know that only half of them are going to be in the office at any given time. So do you really want to spend that kind of money on real estate today? 
not knowing that whether or not your business is going to uh, be growing. If it doesn't happen, you're stuck with a 25,000 square foot lease for seven, 10 years. That's a huge liability. Somebody has to pick that up. When Lehman Brothers went under, somebody had to pick that up. We picked up a chunk of that, actually, because they had a lot of space with us. Um, but you know, that's, when the tech companies went out of business, somebody had to pick that up. And a lot of landlords have been very seriously burned. And they don't want to extend terms to people. They don't want to build out space for people and pay for everything that they want in their office space without some sort of meaningful securitization. Businesses don't necessarily want to give that securitization up because to them, they need to have that money in the bank. They could do other things with that. So we're starting to see a lot more flexible workspaces coming up. This is where Regis really comes in. This is where we've built our business around it. But look, we're not the only game in town. There are a lot of other people like Regis that do what we do. Probably not on a global scale. But let's face it, how many of you have been to Dubai in the last 30 days? Not a lot. We have office space in Dubai. If you need some, talk to Maria, talk to me, talk to Diane. We can get it for you. It doesn't happen all that much. Strangely enough, I was actually doing a tour yesterday with somebody who was from Dubai who actually, and I had already planned to say all this, you know, was from Dubai and actually uh, was very interested in knowing where specifically our offices were in Dubai. So I, I found that very ironic because I've been using that Dubai thing for a long time. Somebody actually did need it yesterday. Um, so it happens from time to time. But, um, you know, I think that there is an awful lot of trepidation still in the marketplace. And you know, when you, you have a lot of these factors going on, people that, that really do truly want to grow and want to grow fast and have the capability of growing fast, but then you know, don't want to take on the risk that is inherent with make, taking on those types of challenges and actually doing that. That takes money to do that, and they don't want to separate from their money, yet they also need to have this flexibility. Now, look, this isn't just you know, a one-off company. It, meaning that it's not just like a startup company or an entrepreneur that faces these challenges. This is also the Fortune 500 company that's out there today too. And you can drive up and down you know, the business parks along here, whether it's Conway Farms or whether it's out in Hoffman Estates in Prairie Stone or whether it's somewhere downtown. Usually you can see it more effectively when you can see a parking lot. The parking lots are not necessarily full. That does not mean that these leases are, are not, or, or that the, the floors themselves are not full, or that the buildings aren't full, just means that people aren't working in the offices anymore. And why not? They don't have to. And so I you know, challenge all of you to think for your business, what could you use? How could you grow your business if you thought outside of just the office space that you have? And not thinking necessarily about the office space, but this is another thing that we're seeing quite a bit of, is people who don't even need office space. What they need is an office presence. They need a place that they can call is their address and that they have an 847 phone number with a local exchange and they can say that they're in Lake Forest. That's a meaningful address. People want that. People want to see it's 150 um, you know, Saunders Road, Suite 100. They don't necessarily want to see that it's um, a, Main Street, well, maybe Main Street's a bad example, but maybe it's Elm Street, you know, apartment 23B. I mean, that's not necessarily the right type of business address that people want. We're also seeing people that want to take um, a phone number or address in other parts of the world to be able to legitimize their business. It's not imp as important anymore just to have a web address. Anybody can have a website, and that instantly puts you on the map. But there are many businesses that are, are looking to take what's called a virtual office. And this also has been around for 20 years, but it's really just starting to take off now where people understand exactly what this is. It's, uh, it's an office presence without actually having to have the office. And I'm pretty sure that most people, even in this room, you're not thinking about it today because you're not thinking about office space. You're not thinking about you know, how you can globalize your business or legitimize your business in other ways. This is the way that people are already doing it today. And, uh, and it's not just today about the office space. It really is about how you need to use the office, whether or not you use the space or not. So that really is driving our whole strategy as Regis. Um, you know, we've spent uh, the better part of the last 10 years acquiring other businesses, establishing a larger presence throughout the world. We're currently in over 85 different countries. And uh, when we look at where our revenues have changed, the, the revenue streams that we've had, they've changed dramatically over the, these last 40 years. And the industry has been around for 40 years. 
And it, it's always been about the real estate itself. It's always been about the office. Granted, the office size has changed. How people use it has changed. We now have three people that are working inside a 150-square-foot um, office, largely because it can comfortably now today because you don't have 19-inch monitors heating up the whole place, and people aren't always in the office all the time. So that definitely helps. But you have like this, uh, you have this um, shift within the, uh, uh, the, 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 our revenue streams of people that have really become more self-sufficient. And we've really followed that same path that I just outlined for you of how technology has changed up and people have become more self-sufficient. We used to get a lot of revenue from people needing admin support and uh, needing to have secretarial services. And when I said that we had nine people Two of those people were dedicated to answering phones. We called them telephonists. Um, that was an actual position, and I doubt that it even exists today. And we had people that all they did was dictation, all they did was work on the IBM Selectric, right? We still have a couple of places that have IBM Selectrics too. It's awesome. And people that actually still want, because we have good clients who've been with us for 30 or 40 years and they still want to use it. So it's really pretty cool. Um, but today, um, you know, our, our revenue has gone from, you know, getting a big chunk from, from those areas where they were people oriented to now being more infrastructure based. So, you know, we went through the whole fax where we saw a lot of revenue coming from fax and that's disappeared. And now today it's, it's still in telephone. It's not from telephone calls so much anymore because you can get great rates no matter what you do. You get Skype, you get all sorts of things like that. Um, and, uh, and we also get it from internet usage. So it's the infrastructure that we've created that allow people um, to use those things. But even that's changing. We know that down the road, our revenues from phone and, and internet usage is gonna go away. So what we're trying to do now is cater to that mobile worker. And uh, you know, the mobile worker is no longer a mythological creature out there like Sasquatch or um, Bigfoot. They really are you and me, they're everybody. We're all out there um, working um, uh, anywhere, anytime. And so we've created products that allow us to leverage our usage. And this is what you're seeing. If you're reading the article there, you're reading about business lounges, you're reading about you know, other types of places that people, cafes, people can go to work in a professional environment. That's what people want. That's where the workplace is changing today. I think we're always gonna have the office um, and we're always gonna have a need to go to communicate. And I was talking um, earlier, we were talking about uh, Lake Forest and the challenges of recruiting and whether or not the internet was uh, and e uh, online learning was having an impact on, um, on your business. And, uh, and, and you said something that really resonates with us too. And that is people still need to have that face to face. You still need to have a collaborative environment with which that you can work productively. Um, you know, as much as we've you know, had all these different communications and technology advances and, and various ways that may have been designed to make it easier for us to work, I don't think it really has, um, we still need to have face-to-face -face communication with people. And so that's what we're trying to build. And I think that over the next 20 years, we're gonna see even more of that. So I think personally, our competitive landscape is gonna change dramatically. I think it's gonna make it a lot easier for all of you to be able to work much closer to home as we start putting more and more of these professional environments where you can work productively in a professional environment, have the infrastructure that you need to support your business when you actually need it. And uh, you know, I think it'll be real interesting to see how it all uh, shapes out in the next couple of years. But I'm very pleased that Regis is now in the Lake Forest market and I'm very happy to have been invited um, to join today and to uh, take part of this. Hopefully this has been you know, somewhat useful. Hopefully you'll get some value out of it. Um, anybody have any comments that they'd like to make or any questions? What do you have that our members might use? Do you have a conference? It, all of our business centers, just to, uh, I can draw a picture for you, uh, if you will, in the air of what we have in each one of our business centers. Predominantly, it's uh, made up of private offices. And these are offices that companies can use, whether they're a virtual office client or a business world client can come in and use it um, for the day um, at uh, uh, discounted rates. But most of them are uh, full-time office clients that rent out these offices. And they'll rent it out either uh, you know, for three-month terms or 12-month or 24-month terms. Um, and they can range from one person that has one office to having uh, one company that has 10 offices. Um, to having one person in each office, to having three or four people in each office. They really can work however that they want to work that's most efficient for them. So th that still is a majority of the uh, floor space that we have is made up in that. We also have 
meeting rooms that are available on demand. So uh, clients can uh, rent those all day. They can go online and reserve the. We can uh, they also go to uh, call the center directly. They can walk up to reception. Uh, any number of ways they can reserve those meeting rooms. Um, so those are available as well. And they range from a four-person meeting room to six-person meeting room to most of our uh, boardrooms will seat anywhere between eight to 14 people. Um, and then we also have in, uh, in most markets, we have what we refer to as a training room where maybe you have 20 or 30 people that you need to bring in. Um, we have those types of facilities as well. Um, majority of our facilities have video conferencing as well. This is a high definition video conference um, product and we're the world's largest private provider of uh, teleconferencing and so we have these um, amazing pieces of equipment everywhere in the world. So actually we do end up doing a lot of video conferences with people in China, with people all over the world. It, it kind of creates problems for us staffing wise when we need to bring somebody in at three in the morning for a video conference in China, but you know, that's the way it works. Um, and then we also have what we call a business lounge. And a business lounge is, uh, is a place where our clients can, um, uh, it's, it's seating a lot like you would find in an airline club. Um, you have uh, nice soft seating, you have a television in there which is set to a business news station, um, and then you have uh, the ability to get coffee, um, water, um, on demand. It's a, it's a really great machine that you can get a, a lot like you might get at home with like your Keurig machines. It's a, you know, the quality is, is outstanding. Um, you can have water uh, right there too, and that's all free for your guests that you bring in as well. So we have the lounge, we have the cafe, we also have uh, a reception area, and we also have uh, what we call our client service representatives that are always at the front desk. So somebody is always there to answer any questions that you have and, uh, and help you out with anything that you need. And they represent um, our clients. So they'll answer the phone there, they answer it the way that however it is that that uh, particular client wants their phone answered. Um, and, uh, and they do it professionally and then they transfer the call or you know, whatever needs to be happened. Scott, yes, I was going to say, um, share the example of when someone's in the city too, that if they're, I know Maria had, had shared that one, when someone is down in the city and wants to meet with a client or Yeah, I, th that's, a, that, that's a great point. A, a specific example might be if you are, um, you know, you're downtown for an appointment and maybe you have time to kill and you don't want to sit in a Starbucks for four hours before your next appointment, maybe you do want to come into a Regis Center. We have 12 locations downtown and they're all West Loop, Central Loop, North Michigan Avenue. Chances are where you are downtown, we probably have someplace clo close. So feel free to download the Regis app to your phone, which when you press it, it automatically shows up the closest business center. It's actually really cool. Um, and gives you the telephone number that you can call. But with your Business World card, you can go into any of those centers. You have access to all of those centers in any place that you want to go. So let's say that you're downtown and you have, you're going to be meeting with somebody um, and you don't want to meet in a Starbucks or you don't want to meet uh, you know, at a restaurant or maybe you've already had lunch and you don't want to have a second lunch. You know, and the martini lunch is gone too, so we know that you can have a meeting after that lunch. Um, then I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely what you can do is just come into a Regis Center and you can have a nice ad hoc meeting in a very professional environment or if you needed to have an interview with somebody and you needed to have a private office, you have the availability to be able to get that. Uh, basically, wherever you are, there's, there's a Regis close to you. We're all over the city. As far south as Orland Park and uh, Lake Forest is our most northern center. We're even in other neighborhoods like uh, St. Charles. Um, it's a real interesting trend that we're starting to get into is getting more into the lifestyle malls where people actually are shopping and want to work. They live by there, so we're opening up business centers there too. St. Charles is an excellent location for us just for that very purpose, right downtown. Um, and uh, you know, getting into neighborhoods is really part of our next strategy, so we're much closer to where people actually live. Um, and so whether you're downtown or whether you're, you know, just happen to be visiting somebody in uh, some other market, I encourage you to look up if you need a professional place to, to sit down and do some work, we're a great option for that. Uh, we do have some of the best addresses in the world. Some of them are here in Chicago. We're at 875 North Michigan, which is the John Hancock Center. We're on the 31st floor. It is quite possibly the most dramatic business lounge that we have. Uh, it definitely is in Chicago. It's fantastic looking out over the lake. It's unbelievable and it's a really great place that if you want to impress somebody, it's a great place to impress somebody. 
Um, and then, you know, all the way down the line from 200 South Wacker, 30 South Wacker, um, we are in some buildings that are, you know, not off the beaten path, but not necessarily, they're more economical. They would be considered Class B buildings, buildings like 10 South Riverside downtown. Still a great building, great location for us, um, but, and it might just, it's right by, it's right on top of uh, uh, Union Station and right across from Ogilvy. So in terms of something that, that might be really useful for you to be able to use, maybe that one too. And that tends to get, it's easier to get into some of those buildings too with the security that you have downtown. But even if you're, you know, out in the suburbs, you, we have two locations in Northbrook, um, Five Revere Drive, we're on Skokie Boulevard, we're down in Skokie off of Old Orchard Boulevard, we're here uh, in Lake Forest, as I, as I mentioned, right down the street um, off of uh, Saunders, basically the southeast corner of, uh, of 60 and 94. Um, great spot, very easy to get in and out of. Um, and even, as I, as I mentioned, down south in Orland Park. But you know what, we're all over the place. We're in every single major city you can think of in the United States. And most secondary cities and tertiary cities. There's an app for it. Yeah, and there, I already mentioned the app. I said, yeah, just, yeah. Just download it's uh, <laughs> iPhone or Android. We don't care. Either one, it'll work. Scott, thank you so much. Thanks thank for you having me. So